dry dust. Trying to downplay the health significance of that, but we, we call them hot particles, and they they wind up um, in kids' shoelaces, and then the kid ties his shoes and they're on his hands, and then they're in his gut. So it's um, uh, it's a long-term problem. Uh, you know, I, I'm on record as saying that we can expect a, um, a significant increase in cancers over the next 20 or 30 years especially in women and, and, um, and young children as, as a result of this. But right now, you know, you, you, um, um, we're just seeing uh, thyroid nodules. So the, the first indication of the problem is that there's about 30 or 40 percent of the people in uh, Fukushima Prefecture have um, lumps in their thyroid, and that's an indication of radiation exposure that could lead to thyroid cancers. Oh, that's very interesting. So if, if people choose to stay in Japan, they very much need to treat their areas and con, uh, contaminate area. And, and when they go back into their homes, they need to decontaminate. They need to take their shoes off, have like a staging area in their home where they can take their shoes and their clothing off and and uh, basically treat their uh, their attire as a contaminated material if they need, near, live anywhere near the plants, I assume. Yeah, but anywhere near is as far out as 100 miles. You know, it's... Uh, it, it's uh, it's insidious, and, um, and what we're advising is people should um, should wet dust. Don't dry dust because it just throws the dust right back up again. But but make sure you're dusting with a, a wet cloth, and and you frequently change your vacuum cleaner, things like that. Um, but it's tough. There is there is really no way to decontaminate. It's everywhere, and this is what we're seeing. It doesn't matter. You open the door, it comes in. And it's it's that simple. They're finding now vacuum cleaner bags, air conditioning. Uh, well, when you have a return air, you've got a filter there, and it picks up all the air. It goes back into the, your HVA system. They're showing up with tremendous levels of radioactivity. It's it's and over here too, people are having theirs tested, and they're not happy with the results. So I don't know where it's going, but it's not going in a position or a place or a location that I'm I'm at all pleased about. Well, you know, it's very important to note what Arnie also said about those tests of those HEPA filters uh, in Japan. Uh, apparently, he got uh, a hold of one that was running since uh, uh, March 11th, 2011, right. 3-11, right. Uh, our day of disaster that has not quit. He pointed out that what was in that filter wasn't in the lungs of the people that owned it. And while there is no way to completely shut off this radiation, uh, there's a couple of things that people have to remember. There are many ways to mitigate and lower the amount, but don't think for one second that this problem is confined to the island of Japan. It is not. Thank goodness the Japanese people are rising up and saying, enough. The fact of the matter is, it's all over the place. We just had a, a fellow who uh, flew down to uh, uh, New Orleans, and he came back and uh, tested his uh, filters, and they were higher by a factor of 33% in terms of hot particles that he could detect on the mask he wore in the jet flying about the same distance as the mask that Denise and I wore flying across the country last year uh, in about the same distance. So. That means that while this disaster keeps going on, it's not like a fire or, or that goes away. That you know, maybe the forest is burned down, but there, there's no fire left. Right. This right. fire keeps going, and we have now in Japan have had a detection of radiation, cesium one thirty seven and cesium one thirty four in California almonds, and. Uh, I think, Jeff, you broke this. We got uh, the story up there, yeah. That's right. And so, folks, don't ever, ever miss Jeff's incredible list of headlines because, uh, you know, he, he, he machinates them. And you're getting the best. But what we have is California almonds showing 0 0.17 back rolls per gram. Now, this, one might say, well, why does that matter? Well, because, because it's in every vegetable, every fruit. It's in every tree that was exposed to 
of the cesium that came over here came down in the rain, went into the soil, and is now in the plants themselves, in the trees, in the fruit. It's all there. It's in the pine needles. Oh, yeah. And, you know, if people, a lot of folks know about our Eat Me uh, 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 section on EnviroReporter.com where we go and analyze the food we get uh, for people that if they just are just out, don't have a detector and they want to at least get an idea of what is in the food that they're buying at this store that might generally correlate to that store at some other location, which is iffy at best right there. The fact is, Jeff, we've been using almond milk uh, for a, a while now, and now we have this detection in almonds. And if one were to ask, well, have you detected it in your almond milk? The answer is no. But the reason is that almond milk is mostly made up of water, and water is a radiation shield. I mean, that's why we have spent fuel pools, because they, the water is a very effective radiation blocker. Now, if one says, well, then if that's the case, we don't need lead, we just need water around us, how many people are going to wear a water suit thick enough to keep out the radiation and then not inhale or ingest? But about the numbers, Jeff, in these... Um, uh, uh, California almonds, first things first, uh, as a journalist, I, te- I check the source. And I know that we have a lot of listeners, uh, English-speaking listeners, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, English, Americans, Australians, in Japan that listen to this show. Well, I want you to take note of a website called securitytokyo.com. They're the ones who have this uh, uh, report on the almonds. So I took a real close look at securitytokyo.com, and Jeff, it has fantastic radiation reading from Tokyo, major cities throughout uh, Japan, all sorts of food stuff. This is a great site. But then, let's go back to these almonds. What does it mean? I mean, you know, uh, the amount they found works out to be about 4.59 4.59 picocuries per gram. And if one were to, say, compare a gram uh, versus uh, 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 how much in, say, water or milk, this would exceed that if you were to use the solid as the same weight as the liquid. Uh, it gets a little scientific-y, but if this were a liquid, and if we're coming in at 4.59, it'd be way over. It'd be 50% over the maximum limit the government allows. But it is a food product. So instead of protecting uh, people with this food product, uh, using basically the same standards that you would use for milk and water, because remember, folks, it doesn't matter if you drink it or eat it. It's the same thing. The standards, Jeff, for milk... Uh, for the FDA's so-called derived intervention level for the combination of cesium-134 and 137, which is this what this report's about, their, their limit is 32,000 picocuries per kilogram, or 1,200 per, per, uh, uh, becquerels per kilogram, and you divide that down, and this amount is exceeds that. And this is stuff we've shipped off to Japan. Now, the Japanese actually, right now, have stricter, and we've talked about this, they have stricter radiation limits on some food. But what that means is, if they grow some tea that's too hot for them, they export it. Who do you think is the number one consumer of Japanese tea in the world? It's us. So... When we think about the, the overall, the, the, the enormity of this uh, disaster, it comes right back around again to us. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, nothing is going to happen. This report that came out, Jeff, uh, the Japanese parliament released a Fukushima report since we last talked that the disaster was, quote, unquote, clearly man-made, that the uh, evidence that the quake damaged uh, safety equipment, not the tsunami, that this was a disaster waiting to happen, that the culture, the cultural behavior towards 
the nuclear industry in Japan and the unquestioning of it led this to happen. Now, if I were to hear that, and I was a typical uh, listener, I might just say, yeah, Japan, thank God it's not us. Well, guess what, folks? We have a, a, a congressman who came out on July 5th, uh, Ed Markey from Massachusetts. He's the senior member of uh, he's a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, which is supposed to be in charge of our 104 nuclear reactors throughout America. And what he says is this: We have that same culture. We are unquestioning. We do nothing. We don't demand the best. We're not in implementing the things that we should be implementing, lessons learned from Fukushima. We're not doing any of it. So there are two major ways that people can think about their exposure to radiation. They know if they follow any of the work we've been doing and all the good work Jeff's been doing, we know we have been exposed on every medium, every media, to some level of Fukushima radiation. And it's not like, well, okay, I was exposed to uh, some uh, sea spray filled with uranium-60 buckyballs down by the Pacific three months ago. Breathed in a bunch of it. Eh, you know, that was three months ago. I don't feel bad. The fact of the matter is I would expel most of that by the exhale. I would expel it through other processes in the body if it got into my body. But there'd be a small amount that wouldn't go away. And if I this keeps up, you slowly build that bioaccumulation, and that's when the alarm bells in your body go off. And there are many ways to combat this. And we go through it ad nauseum, and I won't recover it right now. But the point is this. We have a, a U.S. congressman coming out in the last week said, we've got a problem here, we're not addressing it. We have hundreds of thousands of Japanese in the street protesting the actions of their government burning radioactive debris from the Fukushima prefecture in 27 different prefectures. And most of us are sitting there going, well, do I need to get some more batteries? Is that what you're telling me? That's not going to work. The fact that you're here listening to us, that's a big step. But I gotta tell you, Jeff, this is such an uphill battle that the fact that we got the feature cover story in the Pasadena Weekly this week, which is a August paper uh, in Pasadena where the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is, uh, uh, the reprint of the Ventura County Reporter's a Radioactive Nightmare is saying something. At least the people in Pasadena have 100,000 plus, probably around 130,000 people actually saw the physical paper product. And the odd thing is when people see it in print, for some reason they think it's more legitimate. And, uh, uh, well, it does say that there's a news organization behind it, and it does say that there are assets that could be sued and, and taken away, so they have to be, you know, responsible and not print uh, uh, untrue uh things, which of course we know is not always the case, uh, but it is a, it's a major deal that we managed to get that piece out again. But if folks don't act upon the information, if you are a spectator, uh, that's just not going to work. And I got to tell you, and Jeff knows this, people say, hey, are you paranoid? I mean, Denise and you, you've got the supplies, you got them over at some other place, you got them there, you got them here, you... you, you you really, you're pretty prepared there. And, of course, Jeff, we're not prepared enough. And they say, you paranoid? And I say, no, no, I'm not paranoid. I'm prepared. That's not paranoia. You should be paranoid. So these, these things aren't like obscure factoids that we're pulling out of the air just telling you, folks, this is all part and parcel of a very bad thing happening. And it's the perfect crime because the victim is assisting in the crime by silence, by not, by saying, you know what, I don't like the policy of Japan burning all that stuff and us getting the double dose of Fukushima. We're getting the, the same outrageous amount 
of uh, radioactive water going into the Pacific, if not more. We don't really know. Just like what Jeff said earlier in the show about that the, the, the spent fuel pool could collapse upon the very things holding it up. I'm sure, Jeff, that that 65 or what, 67 ton iron lid that they put on the spent fuel pool is not going to, you know, really help matters by sitting on top of it with this uh, building ready to collapse. And as Jeff will tell you, everything we talk about becomes moot if that thing falls. That thing falls, that thing breaks, that thing loses its water, catches fire, fissioning, toast. We can't, we won't be able to get near, we. I, I wish it were we, not these folks taking those weekends that Jeff mentioned, you know, Jeff felt, hey, go on for the weekend. Well, we there are, a there, triple meltdown going on here. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Also, they're running out of workers who will actually go into that place and continue to labor for TEPCO. They're running out of engineers who will go in there and try to formulate plans to work on stabilizing what's left of that wrecked plant. They are running out of carbon-based workers. Truth. That is really scary. This isn't like uh, some telephone company call center where you can farm out the work to somebody who you can't understand. This is the real deal. You run out of workers. What are you going to do? Open the floodgates and say, okay, all you folks from all those countries that would like to emigrate to Japan, if you've got this skill set, we're going to run you right into that reactor. I'm sure that people are just going to be lining up for that. This I, I hadn't thought of this in a long time. In the very beginning of this disaster, Jeff, I thought about at some point they're going to run out of people. And they are. God bless those they are running that have out. Already been exposed. Well, they're already they're dying. Uh, they've run out of people. The the yakuza can't generate enough bodies to go in there and do the work. Um, it's not a good situation, and it's going to only get worse. I don't know oh, what yeah. they're going to have to do. Conscript the army to go in there at some point and begin to run it. Very short shifts and get them out of there. Rotate them in and out. Something's going to have to be done because they are running out of people. Well, I'll tell you, we have this environmental war goes all the way across the Pacific, and we now have a new group of people that have inspector alerts and other fine nuclear radiation monitors. And a lot of those people live in the Pacific Northwest, and like the guys who should have been with their binoculars to the sky on the morning of December 7th, 1941, we need those folks to keep an eye out for Fukushima-related debris and to get that debris and to test that debris because you're our front line. And when, but the thing is, this is a silent and invisible and doesn't smell enemy. We all have to take effort to protect ourselves. And uh, the more, you know, the farther away we get from the actual thing, uh, the less people are doing it. You know, there are things that bear repeating every time you hear us talking. And here's one, since we're wrapping it down now, it's summertime, it's vacation time. If you're going to get on a jet, put masks on. You're not going to look weird. Nobody's going to do a double take. You don't wear them into the jet. You can take them off when you're eating or going to the bathroom, but get N. 95 rated masks. Put them on you and yours, especially those kids. Their lungs will thank you for it because it's hot up there. And say a little prayer for all those stewards and stewardesses and pilots and co-pilots that are flying up there and not taking any precautions at all because nobody's told them to do otherwise, which is a crime in my way of looking at things. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, the N95 masks, fortunately, are readily available. They're, uh, they're not terribly uncomfortable. And put them on. We're just getting too many reports now of people taking their Inspector Pluses on aircraft and getting readings. You've done it. Others have done it. We'll be seeing more and more of that. I'm curious about foodstuffs in the marketplace, and I know you'll be doing more checking yes. on that, Michael, soon. Uh, Absolutely. This is, this is important. 
And I again go back to the idea of the Pacific being double in its radioactive content in the next five years. I think it'll be more like five to ten times what it is now in the next two to three years. And that means the marine layer of moisture, aerosolized micro droplets, is going to be deadly. Over time, it's not going to help people. They're going to get sick over time. And it's uh, nobody's doing a damn thing about it. Nobody's talking about it. It's business as usual. We have the same kind of blind sheep over here as we did in Japan. The Japanese have awakened. Enough? Will the government do anything? I doubt it. But they're at least out there trying. The people here are clueless, and they're going to stay that way. When you see it in the almonds, you know we've got problems. Remember it was in the dairy of uh, at the end of March in dairy milk in Vermont cattle? This, this stuff is everywhere. And it's going to continue. And God help us all if Spent Fuel Pool 4 takes a dive. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Congratulations again on the award. You uh, and Denise deserve it so much, and I'm, I'm really happy for you. Thank you so much. Website of the year from the Greater L.A. Press Club. And that's an award that belongs to everybody listening because you all participate in that website. Wonderful. EnviroReporter.com. Thank you, Michael. Give Denise a hug. Thank you. All right. Okay, be well. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, uh, that's our half hour with Michael Collins. And we'll slide into our break and come back and talk to uh, Yochi Shimatsu, who will give us uh, an analysis, again, that is second to none. So stay tuned for that. Okay, let's get right back to it. Our last half hour tonight, and we're going to go to Hong Kong and talk to Yochi Shimatsu and get the latest on the <laughs> astounding. Uh, really, words don't come close to being able to describe the catastrophe. And I hope all of you saw the stories about the cesium-137 and how it will spread across the Pacific and basically pile up on the West Coast. It's actually going to pile up and intensify in the coastal waters of the west coast off the U.S. and Canada. And this is, a, this is a tragedy. This is going to go on for decades. We don't know. Uh, they're projecting out 10 years now, and things are not looking good. There's a lot to talk about. Yochi, how are you? Well, okay. I uh, Sorry about the miss last week. I was out in a very remote part of Thailand, village, no internet, no phone, and so I apologize for that. I had other projects, cultural projects. The other thing besides Fukushima, because we all have to make the money so that we can go up to Fukushima. So, anyway, so I'm in Hong Kong now. We're just in Bangkok, where I met some friends, foreign friends, on Khaosan Road, the Backpacker Road. And hundreds of people were lined up on the road, staring at the sky toward the east at a giant formation in the sky that looked like a iridescent opal, same shape, uh, uh, oval gigantic thing over the Andaman Ocean, I suppose, as far away. Uh, they're iridescent, blowing shades of red and orange and uh, streaks of blue and yellow, uh, like the eye of God in the sky, except it's the eye of a demon, not of a god. And uh, what this indicates, this is the same time late afternoon as the uh, northern lights were blazing across uh, northern America, in fact, well into the United States. So this is just like the uh, aurora borealis that was seen in January. In the north, that was a dancing green giant, uh, dragon, we call it, a dancing green giant, uh, dragon back then. Uh, this time, it was a multi-hued, uh, rainbow color thing, strongly red and green. So, uh, in January, we could see, uh, the, uh, let's say eight, nine day half-life of, uh-huh. um, uh-huh. uh, xenon gas. This time, uh, red and green, the other, the both ends of the spectrum, are indicative of iodized strontium in the right. environment, in the atmosphere. Right. As far down as Thailand in the tropics, we can no longer talk about a borealis. It's an aurora tropicalis. Probably hasn't been seen for millions of years, <laughs> and there was hardly a you know, atmosphere over mm-hmm. Earth. So what mm-hmm. this indicates uh, is that the ozone is gone all around the planet, and we are losing, at this moment, we are losing our atmosphere. And this goes on perhaps with it. It could happen very rapidly. It could happen nearly overnight. We lose our, as it did on Mars when Mars was circled, 
by uh, vast meteors of uranium from a uh-huh. distant star, all of which landed on a dead Earth at the time. Right. That's how Mars lost its uh, atmosphere through uh, radiation uh, in the upper atmosphere, and all the gases were gone very, very quickly, nearly overnight. That could happen to Earth. We could be the next Mars, the, uh, the last of the dead planets, the last of the uh, two dead planets mm-hmm. of our solar system. It'll be the end of life in the uh, you know system stall. I hope that would you be a tragedy of nuclear power. These people have traded in for comfort, convenience, yes. and profit. They traded in all life on Earth, and uh-huh. we could well lose it, given this gigantic eye in the sky. Huh? Yeah. So you may not have the ten years for seeking to build up in America. You know, everything could be gone by then. Uh, I, I think they're still trying to build nuclear power plants. They just switched on a couple of reactors on the east coast. On, of Japan, on the west coast of Japan. So these maniacs, these total, insanely genocidal of all life on Earth maniacs, are yeah, still at it. Yeah, They're still yeah. after profits and the promise of delivering convenience and comfort to the rest of us. I tell you, if I had a choice between my life and air conditioning, I know what I would choose. You can have the air conditioning, I prefer to live. Mm-hmm. All right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so that's, that's the trade off. And these people are at it, and I know there's a lot of people on the streets of Tokyo for weeks now. You know, it's very getting hot there. It's hot and humid, wet. Uh, you know, more than a hundred thousand, uh, sometimes maybe two hundred thousand people gather outside. They say hundred, hundred and seven, hundred and seventy thousand today. Yeah, probably that is a uh, conservative count. You know, because people are coming in and out of the city. A lot of them can't afford to stay a long time in Tokyo. It's an expensive city, as everyone knows. The people are shuttling in. So a lot of people, uh, a good uh, quarter million people have been in and out of Tokyo. And most of those are not Tokyo residents who are foolish enough. They're the beneficiaries. Tokyo residents are the beneficiaries of the power coming out of Fukushima and Tohoku. These are the people addicted to comfort, money, and they've parked all their families in other countries. They don't have to worry. They don't have to protest. If Japan dies, Northeast uh-huh. Asia dies, uh-huh. they'll just move elsewhere. You know, they, they've got their money in hedge funds. And all that, you know, they're just they're just yacht off to another place. So yeah. there's a real big growing disparity between the global elite and the other seven billion people of this planet. And I think, you know, we talk about the silent ninety nine percent and all that. It's time for people to stop thinking not in my backyard. I mean, one of the problems of these huge protests in Tokyo had we only had half that number last year mm-hmm. and the government was in total crisis and panic, the mm-hmm. government would have been dumped. Mm-hmm. And the caretaker would have been put in to stop nuclear power under Ichiro Osawa. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, we're a year too late. Uh, the establishment, you know, the, 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 the right wing of the, uh, of the Democratic Party has joined with the old liberal Democrats, the nuclear party, and now they have a solid majority against the, uh, the wishes of 70% of the Japanese people and probably 90% of the world. Mm-hmm. So this is like very stubborn political warfare. And we move too late. You know, when the castle is burning, you attack. You don't wait for the shogun to reorganize his forces and get all his troops around the place, which unfortunately the Japanese people, very short-sighted. I'm afraid the American people are becoming like that again. And you know, yes. the, uh, it's like Three Mile Island. No one even, you know, uh, you talk to like 90% of American people, they don't even know what we're talking about. That, That's uh, correct. There was a grand nuclear accident in the United States, mm-hmm. and we still don't know the casualty rates. The Department mm-hmm. of Energy will not fess up to really what happened and how many people, how many deformed babies and so on, what got cancer and all that. No one's going to tell you the truth, so don't expect the truth. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, don't expect the truth. you got to see things with your own eyes. The Northern Lights do not lie. This stuff hasn't been happening in millions of years like this. We're on the verge of losing the ability of this plant to support life in the water, in the atmosphere, we're all going to be gone. And with it, every other species, and I don't even see the whale watchers and all that coming out, which is really outrageous, you know? Huh. We're worried about a few whales being hunted for a uh, for, uh, stew. Mm-hmm. What about the entire species of Pacific whales? You know, dozens of species right. of marine mammals, which are now threatened and washing up as far away as Australia. Now in the South Atlantic, we're seeing penguins washing up. You know, this, this is an extinction event, and we are not immune for that. And these guys in the yacht, they'll be drinking champagne to the end. And you know something? Those people don't care. 
so disconnected from humanity and from life on Earth a long time ago. They made their bargain with the devil. That's you true. Know, with the yeah. Faustian bargain. They don't care. They'll laugh as humanity dies. As your children die, they'll just chuckle it off. And, well, you know, it was, it was a bad investment. You know, you cannot trust these people. Uh, you cannot trust the media that they advertise them and they control. We have got to start acting much more, you know, in unison internationally and not wait for the next explosion in your backyard because it won't come that way. It's not going to happen that way. You know, suddenly you're going to wake up and you're going to see dead kids, dead dogs in your front door, and then you realize you're, you're running out of air, too. And your water is completely ready to last it. And it'll be much, much too late, and there'll never be another chance to have another kid or even maybe another day in your life. So we've got to wake up. It's really time to wake up call. The Japanese people woke up a year early. The rest of the world has got to start waking up. The idea of young children now in the Fukushima area being yeah. afflicted with nodules on their thyroids is, is quite clearly established. We're seeing more and more results of tests, surveys. These kids are all, yeah. uh, tragically, uh, developing, uh, can, they're about developing last cancers. Year, within the week of the, of the blast with the iodine, these kids, you got to get them away as the iodine just sort of runs yeah, yeah, through yep, the air and their yep. water. We're talking about then proofs in now. You know, and uh, this is what I'm saying. You can't wait till next year when it comes to these sort of things. Uh, once you get those uh, problems on your thyroid, it's going to uh, wreck your entire immune system, and you're going to be, you know, destined for a very, very screwed up physical life and mental life probably. So these kids are very doomed. In fact, I'm taking over for at least kids who are not so far got some respiratory pills, uh, extremely expensive stuff, you know, it's probably the only thing uh, that, uh, unfortunately, children are growing. Cell division, their DNA is splitting constantly. And when it's splitting, it's completely vulnerable to neutron strikes, to radiation, gamma radiation. And mm-hmm. once the chromosome starts to break apart, mm-hmm. every other, you know, whenever the cell divides, it's going to create a cancer cell, a monster mm-hmm. cell, mm-hmm. Not, not a healthy cell. So these kids, these poor kids are really in bad shape. Government entirely blame the nuclear industry, but also the parents are not, you know, Japan's 99% not literate. They could have looked up stuff on the net. Most of them have, they have access to the net. They could have gone to the library and read stuff to find out what's happening and departed, even just for a while, and thrown themselves at least on the mercy of relatives or something. That didn't happen. People didn't act. And when they don't rea- uh, react, it makes a huge problem for the rest of us because, you know, I, I go out there to treat people with herbal. i got to make a choice. You know, save a kid who has a chance or uh, make it easier for the one who's dying. Because there ain't enough money, there ain't enough for herbal stuff, there's just not enough time and energy to go around for everybody. So a hard choice has got to made, be made. And uh, that's, a, that's a terrible thing, but, and, uh, you know, it makes you want to cry. But, you know, because your kids haven't really had to enjoy their life yet, and they've been very, very, you know, had a restrained existence without a lot of exercise and all uh, since this blast. It's, they, they're really coming into a world that our civilization, our power craze, you know, convenience-oriented civilization has destroyed the future of these kids. And uh, we're looking into the rise, and we got to decide, Doug, should I give them this limited number of pills that's costing an astonishing amount of money, or do I pass it on to the next kid? That is a choice. Okay. Now, as far as the physical deterioration and the... Yeah. The, the continual work there, they've taken the top off uh, Building 4. There is more talk yeah. about uh, very, very grave uh, situations developing right. and continuing to deteriorate, for that matter. At number three, uh, yeah. we're, we're not getting, we're not seeing anything but what you've predicted, and that is the obvious disintegration of this and what's left of this plant. Right. It's yeah. not getting yeah, any well, better. Yeah, if you really look at the helicopter photos taken by Kyoto News Service, the Associated Press of Japan, in other words, uh, you see that the building, uh, I, I've had experience with a school building in Hong Kong now, so an old one that uh, turned into an environmental center, but it shows clear signs that the right hand, the northern side of the building, uh, is higher than the southern side, which is larger and contains the reactor. What's happened is that the uh, floor, I mean, the footing, I mean, we're talking about, you know, about three meters of concrete, has cracked clean through. The reactor is sinking ever so slowly into the ground. 
and then the, uh, the north side of the structure, relieved of all the weighted reactors, the pillars actually shot up about a half a foot and uh, burst through the floor there. You can see that very distinctly. So it means uh, reactor four is split uh, two-thirds and a third. Uh, it's split and it's sinking. So uh, there's only one thing that could have uh, ripped open the floor like that. It wasn't just the earthquake. It would have to be a corium melt that, in fact, didn't go down right through a hole, but sort of like melted along the line and cracked the floor, overheated the floor in the concrete and it cracked. Uh, so anyways, the concrete would crack from that kind of massive heat and then cooling. And so uh, that's what we're seeing there is that the, that's why they have to get the fuel rods out because everything is filthy on that side. The water, they can't really physically uh, fill the tanks all the way because the tanks are filthy. Uh, so they've got a problem. That's why they have to, they're trying to remove these upper rods. They promised to do it in July. Yeah, but now they're backing it, off and they say they're going to do it. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah. Up. It's back and forth. Uh, probably they can't find uh, a worker crazy enough to sit the top there on that, you know, on that uh, little lift, that, you know, backhoe and operate the thing because, you know, he's, he's just actually going to be a dead man. I, I am amazed at, at what's, mm -hmm. what's going on there. And what's going on there is next to nothing. They're, they're just not doing I Obviously because they can't. They cannot yeah, do anything. Now, they they're technical. talking about, let me talk about removing these fuel rod assemblies from spent yeah. fuel pool number four. All they're going to do is a test, and they're going to pull out two of the, two of the assemblies. They got like a U yeah. hook on it. They're going to pull two of those out. Now, you and I have talked about, and we know, and there have been some scientists who have, who have suggested the obvious, and that's that the earthquake broke a lot of these fuel rods off, and they're sitting at the bottom Absolutely. of the spent fuel pool, yeah. and there's no way in hell they're going to pull them out of there. So this is yeah. a publicity and, stunt. And this is, is unstable. If you, that's if you right. Look at the undercarriage there, all the metal is twisted and melted and broken, you know, so... Uh, you know, it's a matter of time before the tilt turns into a collapse. We had expected to collapse already, you know, but luckily it hasn't. But right now it's a very, very delicate operation. You know, vibrations from the machine, from the machinery. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Up. Once you get a resonance pattern going, so even how you operate the machine, you have to turn it on and off, on and off to prevent resonance from building up, you know. And I, it's not advisable to use a backhoe on the roof. You, you try to use some sort of other crane. Uh, another type of crane, you know, with uh, anchored on two ends, uh, that would be more delicate and wouldn't vibrate the building so much. Because, you know, like that old school that I was working on, that was the tax floor, every time a bus went by, you'd feel like you're on a uh, springboard, on a, you know, in, in a swimming pool. That you're just, the uh, rocking motion is much more intense than on the road. And this is what's happening with earthquakes when machines operate. That building is probably really, really rocking like a boat on water. So... Uh, I, I think this, uh, this is not a very smart solution that they come no, up. with. No, you know? no, and they're supposedly yeah. going to pull them out, transfer them to a an in ground facility. But the, again, yeah. they're not going to be able to pull out at least half, no. maybe no. maybe ninety percent of them. They could all be busted no, no, off. No, we no. don't know. No, the only solution they've got to put up a scaffolding to spread yeah. the weight around all yeah, around yeah, the building, yeah, yeah. and then and then get a you know a uh, a crane that's you know, supported on two or even four sides to uh, lift straight up and down, you know, without vibration. It's their, it's their only hope. But their engineers think in a box, you know. These are nuclear engineers. These guys are not very bright looking at the design that they've kept the Mark I reactors for all these years without uh, made, without just, you know, uh, making them, rendering them obsolete and starting all over from scratch, mm -hmm. which they should have done. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I, look at, I look at this as basically a, a publicity stunt, they're going to pull a couple of assemblies out. Well, They'll no, buy I them. Think it, I think it's legitimate. They've got to no, no, no. It's no. It's, it's it is legitimate. Kind of moving, kind of. But what they're yeah. going to do, Yochi, is pull a couple of them out, and that's going to buy them a lot of time. Yeah, I think they, they see the thing is they announce they cancel they announce they can't decide whether to keep the whole thing secret from the public, yeah, you know, or to use it as a publicity thing. So I, I think that they're of uh, you know they're they're not of common mind here. In the government, you know, in the higher, uh, in the higher echelon, and the government, the, the uh, we never had a chance to talk about this special investigations committee of the Diet of the Japan Japanese National Parliament. The report, uh, can we get that into that just a little bit? Is that all right? Please do. Okay. Across the board, the commission found ignorance and arrogance unforgivable for anyone or any organization that deals with nuclear power. That comes in the first paragraph. Arrogance and ignorance. 
Okay, so they nailed it there, and you have to understand, these are experts, uh, engineers, scientists, professors, and all that, who uh, wrote the report, not members of the parliament. Uh, they talked about regulatory capture with, in which the nuclear industry had all the, basically by capture, they had all the regulators in the bag, and all the bureaucrats in the bag, and the local governments in the bag. Uh, because it was commissioned by Diet, they didn't say the Diet, but it's implied that the Diet members, all except a few, are getting money from the major regional utility companies which operate nuclear power plants. Uh, but the report uh, uh, said very clearly they're not going to decide whether nuclear uh, should be continued or not. It really focused on who was to blame in those very early days of the meltdown when TEPCO and the Prime Minister's office had it out, when Prime Minister Naoto Khan ordered uh, TEPCO, uh, the President Shimizu, not to pull out the workers. And the commission was really focusing on that. And unfortunately, it, uh, their conclusion was it was indeterminate. There seemed to be a series of uh, misunderstandings between the Prime Minister's office and TEPCO because neither had enough information. I see. That TEPCO did order on March 11th, when Unit 2, when Reactor 2 was starting to melt down, they, uh, they ordered an evacuation of all of the uh, workers who work for uh, uh, subsidiary con uh, companies, you know, let's say engineering companies right. uh, and so on, they were all pulled, all the GE workers, Hitachi workers and all, uh, uh -huh. construction uh -huh. workers, uh, you know, cleanup guys were all pulled out. But apparently a core staff was left there in the control room. So it's how you want to, uh, it's how you want to uh, determine, I mean, how you want to define what a pullout. So Tesco claims, they never made, and the commission verifies that they never made a total withdrawal from the plant. So basically, the commission couldn't determine who was at fault. Was it the prime minister for disrupting operations by demanding the use of seawater in the reactors and cooling them down before more meltdowns occurred and after? The report also uh, does not indicate, but the that does says reactors 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, suffered a serious accident. But we've seen in more recent engineering reports out of the plant, five and six were also loaded. So uh -huh. even though only three reactors were supposed to be operational at the time to produce uh, electricity, all six reactors were loaded and uh, three of them scheduled for illegal, unreported operations in the coming weeks, okay, in the coming days and weeks. Uh, the reward also talks about incestuous relationships between regulators and business entities should not be allowed to happen again. That's already happened, unfortunately. And also said that the workers, okay, this is why uh, they took testimony for a subcontractor worker uh, who said uh, on the media news when it was reported that plant workers dealing with the actual emergency workers were prepared to die. Remember the stories of the Braves 300 oh, yes. news week and time of running? Yes. You know, like the 300 last Spartans, you know, at Thermopylae, the brave men. He said, but I was watching the news thinking that there was no way we were ready to die. I did a whole body check for the first time at the end of April, and my radiation dosage was unbelievably high. My heart goes out to the people who are still working to find out how to deal with that. In other words, the 300 there were told they were safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they were, you know, many of them did not have safety suits. They didn't have right. masks, gloves. Right. Uh, they said they had to share one uh, dosimeter among 10 guys. Sometimes the dosimeter just read zero. They were obviously all rigged. They couldn't figure out how the low reading they had low readings on their dosimeters, and then when they go back to a hospital and get a test, uh, you know, uh, within weeks, you know, a couple of weeks, they have unbelievably high rating, uh, readings and that. So the workers, those two hundred, were lied to. This, well, this, is not, this is no longer manslaughter. That's called murder. You bet. I was just going to say murder. they're not. They're not even playing games. They're just flat out executing people. That's right. That's that's. That's that's just third degree. I mean, that's that's premeditated murder. Okay, that that's no no longer manslaughter. This, this is no no. This is not ignorance. It's arrogance. Okay, that's what rules. Those men were uh, dead men walking, and they knew it at the time. The the executives knew it at the time. So that story in the media ate up the story. Of course, our hearts go out to them because they were a front line against this monster, and and we certainly would still continue to support their efforts to protect their health and stay alive. Right. But right. the media should have not taken jumped to the conclusions. They were all there voluntarily. They were there on contract, and they were told, everything's okay, you're safe. And which is why they weren't given a lot of safety equipment. Because if they said everything's okay, and they gave them all a protective suit, then everything is not okay, right? Mm -hmm. So they 
deliberately let them go out there without face masks and gloves and uh, sometimes even helmets on. So or well, eyeglasses and so on. How uh, that is just I'll, that is that's murder. That is simple, cold blooded murder for profit. How many more engineers, how many more workers are there going to be available to work in that death trap, in that plant? Well, as I'm saying, we don't know, and I suspect for when they pull the rods out of reactor four, they're going to be using foreigners. There's a lot of foreigners involved, people from probably from China, from uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and all. Again, they'll be misinformed as to the safety, but they liberally find people who do not speak uh, uh, English or Japanese and put them out there in the sun line to be casualties and then just dump them somewhere. Got it. it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Well, it is, uh, it is a tragedy of uh, ever-unfolding magnitude, and it's not going to... It's not going to go away. It's amazing what we've done to this planet. And how, in a, in a larger sense, Yochi, how lucky we've been that this hasn't happened before. Well, that's, yeah, that is amazing that it hasn't happened before. Unfortunately, it's happening in, in our watch, in yep. our time, and we're the guys who got to face the music here. Indeed. So that's pretty, yeah, that's a sad thing. I'm sorry the first generation of people who built this are not around shovel a little bit of stuff there. And that's the I truth. Think, I think everyone in the nuclear industry should put a little time there with a you know, shovel and a pit to help us clean the place. Right? I agree. I they all show their commitment to their industry that is their cash cow, their holy cow. I hope they mm-hmm. go there to their mother's cow mm-hmm. and knock off its pit. Okay? All right. Thanks, uh, Yochi. Thanks very much. Very Talk good. to you uh, next time. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. That's it for Monday. We'll be back tomorrow. Talk to you then.